Welcome to our study this week of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. My name is Scott Rainey. I serve with the Church of the Nazarene in the area of Nazarene Discipleship International, or NDI. This adult Sunday school video lesson is provided in collaboration between the Foundry Publishing and NDI. The Sunday school lesson is intended to support the local church's efforts to make disciples who make disciples. Please feel free to use this video in any way that helps your church or its families. As we've discussed in previous weeks, the letter to the Hebrews was written by an unknown writer, likely a caring pastor who knew the apostles and had received their instruction. The letter was written more like a sermon than a typical letter of the first century AD. It's important to remember that this letter was written to Hebrew people. The intended recipients understood things from Jewish from a Jewish worldview. They understood the importance of the law, priests, and sacrifices. The Jewish believers had come under persecution, both from the Jews who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and from the Romans who ruled the land. Some of the Jewish Christians were considering returning to the old Jewish traditions and faith. The author of Hebrews, therefore, intended to show Jews that the new covenant in Christ was far superior to the ways of the old. His goal was to help the Jewish believers persevere in their faith because everything in Christ is better. Through Christ, we have, according to the Hebrews, a better hope, a better covenant, better promises, and our final home has better and lasting possessions, and we are in a better country, a heavenly one. Why would those who have come to know Jesus as Savior desire to return to the bondage of their old religious traditions? From Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, through Hebrews 10, our passage for this week, Jesus is revealed as the great high priest who is far superior to any high priest of the past. With Jewish readers in mind, let's take a closer look together at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. The law is, the, is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered for the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an, an, an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the, bull, the, the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, 
He sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made uh, his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He adds, he, then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Some of you might remember the board game called Life. Every player who begins the game is given a car and a peg to represent him or herself in the game. The goal of the game is to go through the spaces on the board, collecting as much money as you can, ending the game with more resources than everyone else that's playing. There's a pivotal decision early in the game that every participant must make. You can choose one of two paths. One path allows you to land on a career that you will hold throughout the game. This path is faster. You start earning money quicker, but your salary is limited. The second path is the choice of the player to go to college before choosing his or her career. This path has more squares. It takes longer to go down this path, but the education received allows for the financial limits of income to be lifted. Limits or ceilings are never fun in life. We naturally want to break through such limitations in order to experience the most we can get out of life. In Hebrews chapter 10, the author begins by describing the limits of the old system of the law. The whole system, he says, is actually a shadow of the good things that are coming, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. The law of the Old Testament was a shadow, not the real thing, of what was to come in Christ. How was the law limited? To understand this first section of scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, we must first grasp the theological concept of atonement. A simple definition of atonement is the process by which God forgives the guilt of our sins and restores us into right relationship with him. The manual of the Church of the Nazarene says, we believe that Jesus Christ, by his sufferings, by the shedding of his own blood, and by his death on the cross, made a full atonement for all human sin, and that this atonement is the only ground of salvation, and that it is sufficient for every individual of Adam's race. To remember the meaning of this word, atonement, some have suggested uh, breaking it into parts. Atonement would then mean uh, at one moment or at one minute. Uh, the idea of atonement then would be we become at one with God. As we think about the old system described in the law, we are reminded of the way atonement was to be made through sacrifices. The people of Israel had sinned against God. The consequence of sin is death. The people needed a way for their sins to be forgiven, a way to be made right before God so that they could come before him in, in worship. A system of animal sacrifices was instituted by the law to make atonement possible. Blood was shed by the animal, death came to the animal as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. When the sacrifices were made, the people were cleansed, at least on the outside, so that they could approach God. This law, with its sacrifices, however, was limited in its ability to, to provide atonement for sins. For one thing, these animal sacrifices had to be repeated endlessly, 
year after year, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. The old system of animal sacrifices had no end to the need to atone for our sins. The reality is that the animal sacrifices cleansed only the outside of the person. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13 says, The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. Since nothing was changed on the inside, the person would simply continue to walk in sin and the animal sacrifices were again needed year after year after year. In the end, the annual sacrifices actually become a regular reminder of sin, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 3. The author begs the question, what would it be like if a new covenant was made that was far superior to the old covenant, one in which the sacrifice was made once for all. That is one sacrifice made one time that was powerful enough to cleanse all sin of all humanity, past, present, and future. It would be the end of the yearly animal sacrifices. And what if that sacrifice could not only cleanse the outside of the person, but could actually cleanse the inside of the person, making the atoned person perfect as he or she draws near to God? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. And what if that sacrifice could clear the conscience completely? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2. Before we move on, I want to take a moment to talk about the word perfect as translated in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, and then again in Hebrews 10, 14, which we'll get to. The Greek verb meaning to perfect occurs nine times in Hebrews, more than in any other book of the Bible. We also find two adjective forms and four noun forms of the same word. The word perfect is derived from a root meaning fulfilling its purpose or goal. The idea of a person being made perfect is not in the sense of becoming without flaw or defect, but rather in the sense of fulfilling the purpose for which they are called. I have this pencil with me today. If I needed something to write with and you gave me this pencil, I might say, this is perfect. Thank you. Now, this pencil is not perfect in the sense of being without deflect, defect or flawed. I can even see teeth marks on this pencil. But if this pencil is perfect in the sense of being able to do what it was intended to do, that is to write, this pencil is perfect. Here's the point. Animal sacrifices could only provide a temporary cleansing of some kind to allow worshipers to enter momentarily into God's presence. They could not deal with the root problem of the sin. The law, the priests, and the sacrifices were helpless to transform the person who had sinned. It is impossible, the author attests, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin like that. So if animal sacrifices are not sufficient to fully atone for our sins, what can fully atone for our sins? Throughout the Old Testament, there's a critique of those who overly emphasize rituals and sacrifices over total obedience to God. One such example is found in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, where it says, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. The most pleasing response to God is a life of obedience that pursues God's justice for his people. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10, the author of this letter finds the same critique in, in Psalm chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. Psalm 40, of course, is credited as the words of King David to the psalmist. 
Here in Hebrews, however, the words are credited to the mouth of Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews quotes Psalm 40, not from the Hebrew text in which it was originally written, but from the Greek translation of the Hebrew text known as the Septuagint. The point of quoting Psalm 40 is to show that God is not as concerned about sacrifices as he is concerned about obedience. The practice of ritual sacrifices apart from obedience and a sincere a commitment to God's will was never the divine intention behind the sacrificial system. Recently in my quiet time with the Lord, I was reading through Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. I've been reading from the CEV, the Contemporary English Version recently. I was struck by the number of times this translation emphasized the desire of the reader to obey God's laws. Psalm 119 verse two says, you blessed all of those who follow your commands from deep in their hearts. Psalm 119 verse five says, I don't want to stray from your laws. Verse 30 says, I'm determined to be faithful and to respect your laws. Verse 32 says, I am eager. Help me to understand more and more. And Psalm 119 verse 34 refers to God, obeying God's law with all my heart. Over and over again, the issue is a desire to obey with all that is in me. God is not pleased with sacrifices, even though they were required by the law. The sacrifice of God that God is pleased with is obedience, doing the will of the Father. Jesus Christ was obedient to the Father, even unto death on the cross. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7 puts the words of Psalm 48 in Jesus' mouth. I desire to do your will, my God. These words draw our attention to Jesus' words in the Garden of Gethsemane. There, in full obedience, Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Here's the bottom line. The by far superior atonement that Christ's sacrifice provides goes beyond merely making the outside of the person clean. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says that by the will of God, obeyed by Jesus, we have been made holy once and for all. Let's not miss the point. The sanctification and holiness of believers is the goal of God's will. This is not a, only a future promise, but a present reality because of the victory Christ attained for us through his sacrificial death and resurrection from the dead. Jesus' complete humanity, perfect obedience, and infinite deity came together and provided a sacrifice so effective that it sanctifies us, makes us holy, and able to enter into God's presence once for all. Once again, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, contrasts the difference between the old Levitical priests compared to the great high priest, Jesus Christ. In the old system, the priests stood continually because their work was never done. Again and again, the priest would offer the same sacrifice, which could never take away our sins. In contrast, the great high priest, Jesus, offered himself once for all as a sacrifice, taking away our sins, and ultimately sat down, signifying that his work is complete at the right hand of the Father, the position of authority. The climax of our lesson is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Once again, we encounter this word perfect. The Greek tenses indicate that Jesus' part is finished. He has made perfect. And our part is in progress. 
we are being made holy. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18 speaks to this progress. It says, and we all who with unveiled faces contem contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. To repeat, the verb to perfect does not refer to perfection that is flawless or without defect. Rather, it speaks to the fulfillment of purpose. In other words, through the sacrifice of Christ, believers can experience the complete realization of God's saving purpose in their life. You see, both salvation and sanctification of a repentant believer is made possible through the same sacrifice, the blood of Jesus Christ. John Wesley said that Jesus had done all that was needed for their full reconciliation to God. How much greater, how much superior is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? There is no other way for our sins to be taken away. There is no other way to have a clear conscience. There is no other way for our hearts to be made right with God. Why would anyone who has tasted Christ return to their old life? 